Hello and welcome back to AmbiV. I'm Casper and today we're going to get the Mustang ready for a trip to SEMA. This year for my trip to SEMA, I'm going to be changing things up a little bit and taking the 1967 Mustang. Now, the 67 Mustang is pretty reliable as a daily driver, but I need to do a few things to get it reliable enough for my confident trip to Vegas. One of the things that's still on the car that I don't trust entirely are the cheapo Chinese disc brakes in the front. Now I've modified them quite a bit and they are working for day-to-day -day driving and for those few autocrosses I've taken it to, but I don't trust them driving all the way through the Nevada desert. So what I've got now is a set of one inch drop spindles from Mayer Racing and a Willwood brake set, which will allow me to drop the front end of the car an inch to get it back into level and go up to a larger size bearing like in a later Mustang. This should give me a lot more confidence in the bearings as well as the machining quality as these will be actual Willwood parts with Mayer Racing parts. Now, rather than discussing the parts too much right now, I'll talk about them as we get them on the car. So let's get started. As you can see here, we now have the Mayer Racing one inch drop spindle in place. I haven't tightened anything up yet, but we can take a look real quickly at how it's made and the big differences between it and the factory spindle. So the one inch drop you can see here is the spindle essentially being moved up the center point about an inch. Now what that's going to do is essentially lower the car. It moves the wheel up, therefore dropping the body of the car down, or at least the appearance of the body of the car. Now, you also have the big difference of the size of the spindle itself, which is why this Willwood kit is actually a 70s era Mustang kit, because it uses the larger, later bearing size. Now, this Mayer Racing setup comes with the mounting brackets for this particular Willwood kit. If you want, you can cut these off or change it up, because this is actually all steel, so you can cut this off, grind it down, and weld on whatever bracket you want, and be good to go, which is a nice feature. You can also tell that this is a lot thicker, heavier duty construction than what you'd see on most street cars. This is, this is definitely built more as a racing component, very heavy duty. Everything's really nicely machined. I'm sure this is gonna be a great upgrade. So let's go ahead and just get this cleaned up, get everything tightened down, and start installing the brakes.
Now that we have the brake hardware in place, I found several major problems with this kit that I want to bring up. Um, a couple of these issues are just weird, and a couple of them are actual showstoppers if you're attempting to do this in your own garage. So first of all, when I put this hub assembly onto the spindle, my erasing warns you that you may not be able to get the castle nut on there without having a thinner castle nut because there's not enough threads before the unit is compressed into place. I have the opposite problem. If I run that castle nut all the way down the spindle, I can't even engage it to the cotter pin. There was enough room that I could put a whole nother nut below it and then put the castle nut on and it fit perfectly. I don't know if that's an actual design change that they just didn't mention on their website. It sure seems like a solution in order to create a locking nut situation, but it's really bizarre that the opposite was mentioned from what actually is occurring here. I was able to get that on here, get that trued up, so it did work, and ultimately this whole hub assembly is working pretty well. Now the other problems are a little more significant and are more quality control issues than anything else. So when I went to mount the calipers onto the actual brackets that are on the Mara Racing setup, there were a couple problems with the fact that the Mara Racing bracket is a lot thinner than the hardware that the Willwood wanted to use. So depending on what spacer shim setup you were using with the washers, you could run the specified hardware all the way in to impact your rotor. So you actually had to use shorter hardware if you didn't need as many shims. The other problem I ran into is that the backing plate was threaded before it was painted. So you have to chase the threads in order to clean them out to make the threading work. But when you do that, you may find out that on the lower uh, threading on the bracket, it's actually pretty poorly cut. I actually couldn't even torque it past 20, 30 foot pounds before it stripped all the threads out of the one unit. And that was after I'd cleaned them up and checked them. What I ended up having to do was put a nut on the back of the plate in order for that bolt to have something to grab onto, and it just barely clears the inside of the rotor. So it does work, but it's not ideal. But by far the biggest issue with this is the fact that once I had everything here and I was testing range of motion, you have range of motion until you try to turn out. The upturned end of the strut rod running from the front of the car back to the control arm smacks directly into the steering pickup of the Meyer Racing part. I have absolutely no idea what configuration change could be made to make that not happen. It seems like you just cannot use that upturned control arm or the upturned strut arm with this. That strut rod would have to be completely deleted or what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut the end of it off with an angle grinder so that I at least have range of motion to move the car in and out of the shop. I actually had to take a break here from the video because I finished recording before I got a response to an email I'd sent to Mare Racing. Now, the president of the company actually responded to me directly and gave me his cell phone number so we could address the issues that I had encountered. Several of the items were simply things that didn't make it into the installation instructions. For instance, cutting the end off the strut rods is something they expect you to have to do, but the updated instructions haven't made it onto the website yet. He also wanted to point out that while they tried to make these as well fitted as possible that there may be customizations that have to happen car to car and that these won't ever be a perfect plug and play solution. He also acknowledged that there are some manufacturing issues they've encountered especially with the threading and the thickness of the backing plate and that the solution that I was using of putting a nut on the back side is exactly how he addressed it in his installations. He simply recommended welding a nut in there so that it was more permanent. I'll probably do this going forward, but after talking to him, he asked if I would do a more specific video on that product outlining my problems, give my honest review, and then discuss some of the solutions so that other customers can be saved time in the future, which I'll do in another video. So now back to your regularly scheduled program. Now I can't finish the installation entirely anyway because I'm still waiting for the fluid hookups. I ended up having to go get Willwood hoses because the adapters I wanted to use to go from the Willwoods NPT port to the soft lines never arrived. So as soon as I get the new lines in, I can finish the installation for that. But I still want to be able to roll the car around. 
So I'm going to go ahead and start cutting on my strut rod end until I make enough clearance for this car to be able to at least reasonably back in and out of the shop. So let's go ahead and start modifying. Now that I've got the end cut off the strut rod, you can kind of see what I'm talking about as far as the freeing of space. Now with the suspension in full droop, I can actually move this enough to hook it back up to the steering. The only way you would have been able to get them hooked up to the steering before is if you had an insane amount of tow. So with this setup, this will work for now, but I still don't understand how they ever intended it to really work. The strut rod is more in the way now with the control arms at full droop, but it was still going to be in the way with the control arms at level. So I'm not sure if it's a combination of how much lowering I have on the car combined with the factory strut rod, or if they've just never put this on a car with factory strut rods and maybe they always have some sort of aftermarket solution. But whatever the case, hopefully cutting the end off will give me the room I need. So now let's go ahead and get the steering hooked up and get the wheel back on the car. Now that the wheels are torqued and the car's on the ground, we can see that the alignment changed a bit. I now have more toe in because of the pickup changes and where the steering attaches. And I also have a slight difference in camber, which I'm not quite sure why the camber is a little different. But ultimately, we got the car on the ground and it looks a little better. I've only got about three fingers worth of gap between the top of the tire and this fender which is pretty good. Hopefully it's not gonna rub. This isn't a race car, so I don't have zero travel suspension. So I really don't want this to start bottoming out all the time, but we'll give it a try later on. As I said before, I don't have the final pieces to hook up the hydraulics so that we can actually test this and bed the brakes yet. I'll do that in the next video. And if you're watching closely in the time-lapse, I didn't hook up the sway bar. I'll be doing that now that it's on the ground. It's a lot easier to get the nuts on top once it's down. If you have any questions about the installation, just leave them in the comments down below. And as always, I'll see you in the next video.